So let me just tell you a little bit about myself. And as I go, you'll pick up a bit about uh, um, my approach to uh, designing for people with dementia. I trained as a clinical psychologist in London by working in a very old fashioned mental hospital. Uh, shortly after qualifying, I moved into the first ever community psychology department in England. It was run by a social services department in the east end of London, a very poor area. My case though had a very high proportion of elderly, elderly people in residential care, and most of them of course had dementia. And in those days, the psychologist's role in that department included supporting the managers of the residential care facilities in helping them understand how to care for their residents. So I was involved in program development from a very early stage in my career. In 1979, I moved to Australia uh, and took up the position of head of psychology in a large psychiatric hospital in New South Wales. And I chose to do my clinical work in the long stay wards that were largely occupied by elderly people with dementia and those with chronic psychosis. In the early 1980s, the New South Wales Department of Health became very unhappy with the quality of care being delivered in these hospitals. It was very expensive and the results were really pretty miserable as was life in those hospitals. And they decided to shift the funding to community-based services. And I was asked to take on the role of regional coordinator of mental health services in a large part of New South Wales. This involved the development of a suite of new services like crisis teams, daycare centres, group homes. But most excitingly and most relevant to today, it also included developing an alternative to providing care for elderly people with dementia in psychiatric hospitals. And I did this by developing plans for what became known as CADE units, C-A-D-E, units for the confused and disturbed elderly. And the New South Wales government announced plans to build 27 of these units across New South Wales to provide local centres for the care of people with dementia uh, to replace the closed hospital wards. Now these units represented a paradigm shift in Australia for the care of people with dementia. Their design and the training of the staff was based essentially on the recognition of a failure the failure of medical science to provide a cure for dementia. Now the recognition of this failure was liberating in the sense it allowed us to ignore dementia on the basis that if there's nothing that we can do about it, we can put, out a, put it out of the picture and ask the question, what do we need to do to help these people lead full lives? Now, the answers to this question took us away from thinking about designing many hospitals for people with dementia and towards providing them with home-like environments where they can, with the help of carefully chosen and carefully trained staff, lead as normal a life as possible. Our thinking went along the lines that hospitals are for treatment, home is for living. If there's no treatment available, then why be constrained by hospital designs? This approach to design was complemented by the steadily increasing emphasis on person-centered care, which began at around the same time as the CAD units were being developed. This approach was most powerfully formulated by a psychologist called Tom Kitwood in England. Now he had a very neat way of summarizing it. It's easy to understand it when you read it in his book because he summarized it by having six words. The six words were, people with dementia. But in the first line of people with dementia, you had people in tiny writing and dementia in very big writing. And he said, this represents the way we've been thinking about things up to now. And his next line was people in big writing with dementia. In other words, he encouraged us to focus on the person, to recognize their individual needs, their individual abilities, and their individual wishes. That was a, a real change in the way in which, I think what, you know, it changed the way in which everybody around the world started to look at people with dementia. Now I've recently had the pleasure of leading the writing of the World Alzheimer's Report 2020 uh, for Alzheimer's Disease International. It's called Design, Dignity, and Dementia dementia-related design and the built environment. It's been described as the most comprehensive overview of the state of the art of 
designing for people with dementia available today. It brings together the work of 58 contributors from 17 countries and presents the argument that designing for people with dementia must have the goals of affording them with dignity, autonomy, independence, equality of opportunity, and non-discrimination. Now at this stage, my knowledge about the development of the Center for Dementia Care and Training at Niemans is limited. But the discussions I've been involved with lead me to believe that there's a strong desire to offer the best available environment for the people who will be living there and for the staff who will be trained in it. I'm hopeful that this will lead to a design that places emphasis on dignity, autonomy and independence, while providing ample opportunities for the exercise of clinical man management when that's likely to be effective. I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to, to, to talk with you and I'm looking forward to talking in a little bit more detail about design for people with dementia a little bit later in the program. Uh, before I go on, I, I do need to just clarify one thing, and that is that I retired from my position as Executive Director of Dementia Training Australia some 18 months ago. So I'm presenting as the ex-Executive Director. Um, I'd also like to make another thing clear, and that is that I fully understand and agree with the comments that were made earlier about it being unwise to think that, that uh, lessons learned in one country can be easily and directly applied in other countries and other cultures. And I, I do want, to, I want you all to bear that in mind as, as I'm presenting, because it's very much in my mind. You know, what I'm going to do over the next 25 or 30 minutes is, is present some points of view that are based on experience uh, within Australia. And um, I hope that there are some underlying principles that underpin that experience that can be applied in other cultures and other countries such as India. But I have to say that that remains to be seen. So please don't at any time think that I'm trying to be prescriptive in what I say. I'm, I'm simply trying to share my experience in the hopes that somehow we might find we're translating it into your context and, and making it useful. I'm gonna share my screen now, at least I hope I am. So I can use a, a PowerPoint presentation to guide my, um, my presentation. So is that working all right? Is my screen being shared okay? I was, I'll assume it has. Um, so I'm going to talk about dementia training, knowledge translation and environmental design. And I'm going to start off by explaining a little bit about the organization that I founded, Dementia Training Australia. Uh, this was an organization uh, that was funded by the Australian uh, federal government, and it was commissioned to provide a nationwide dementia training um, uh, organization. Uh, when I say nationwide, I mean, Australia is a pretty big place. It hasn't got a huge population, certainly by Indian uh, standards, but it's, certainly full of uh, challenges of, of distance and, and scale. So it was a fairly, fairly challenging prospect. The commission that we were given was to provide services in four areas. The first of them was to provide continuing professional development. So this is training for um, GPs and nurses, pharmacists, psychologists, other specialists, allied health people, uh, almost all professionals uh, on assessment of, assessment of dementia, diagnosis and management. Also, there was a very nice little part in the contract that said we could provide this to other professionals as appropriate. And I'm not entirely sure that the government fully understood what they said then, but that gave us the opportunity to provide advice to people like architects. And that's really gonna be you know, the core of what I'm gonna be talking about, the sort of approach that we took to uh, helping people understand the benefits of good design for people with dementia. But as well as CPD, we were also commissioned to provide vocational level dementia training for direct care staff. And it's very, very important to, to make sure that uh, as well as we having the professional people fully on board with uh, better approaches to care for people with dementia, 
the people who actually lay hands on the people living with dementia also need to be brought along as well and to be exposed and educated in better ways of caring for people with dementia. The third thing that the government wanted us to do was to develop and make available a fairly sophisticated online training portal to facilitate online training. I think the, that was a very sensible thing. And of course, COVID has uh, shown the benefits of, of having that up your sleeves. I don't really think personally it takes the place of direct face-to-face -face training and education, but it's certainly a, a very good um, way of getting to a great many people. The fourth thing the government wanted us to do was to make ourselves available to training provide to, to aged care providers who were very clear about their desire to do a better job in caring for people with dementia. So the government wanted the Dementia Training Australia team to be available to go on site, no matter where it was required in Australia, and to provide on site training and education and support. And that proved to be both challenging but extremely satisfying. So they were the four areas that we uh, were commissioned to work in. Now, there's no doubt that training in all fields has gone on for many, many, many years. And it's also gone on in the, in the field of dementia for many, many years as well. But I think equally, there's no doubt that a large part of it has been really embarrassingly ineffective. There's, you know, there's, there's so much information available. I mean, there's, there's no, there's no, you know, we could stop research, I think, in, uh, for, for some years and content ourselves with putting into practice what we already know, because there's so much information available to us. Really, the challenge that we face in dementia care and probably in a great many other fields is not the development of new information. It is getting that information into the hands of people who can and will use it. In other words, as the World Health Organization puts it, closing the, the no-do gap. And it's one thing to know things, but it seems to be quite another to do things better. So from the very beginning, Dementia Training Australia adopted a knowledge translation framework for its activities. Now there are many, many knowledge translation frameworks available. Some of them are extraordinarily complicated and you would fill the screen with arrows and circles going in all different directions. I, th I think they actually overcomplicate things and don't make it easy to get to grips with getting the knowledge into the hands of people who can actually do something with it. So we adopted the simplest of all models, a model uh, developed by Pathman in the, in the mid 1990s, it's quite dated, but it is so simple that it is possible to explain it to people in a way that they understand and for them to use it in understanding their efforts to get knowledge into practice. This model begins with the statement that before we can get any knowledge into practice, we have to raise people's awareness that that knowledge exists. You know, until people know that there's a new idea around, uh, clearly they can't implement it. And of course, many of us are involved in raising awareness of new ideas you know, through publication. And you know, many of us who are academics have spent, a great, have spent a great deal of time publishing things. And sadly, and I have to say that this applies to me in the early part of my career as much as anybody else, you know, we've believed that that's been the end of our job. You know, we've, we've, we've developed a new idea, we've refined it, we've published it, what more are we expected to do? Well, I think things have changed now, and I think we, we as academics and certainly we as practitioners are expected to do a great deal more. I think at the very least, the next thing we're expected to do is to help people check whether or not that knowledge is useful and relevant to them. In other words, whether they can agree that this is a good idea. Now this of course requires a different approach. It requires a discussion. You know, 
always, always best carried on face to face. So you can really kick the tires of a new idea and really find out if it fits with the people that you want to apply it. Now let's say you get that far, you get them to agree that this is a good idea. Well, then you're poised for the next stage of Pathman's model of knowledge translation, and that is adoption. That is setting up the circumstances so that that idea can be put into practice. That might mean working alongside uh, the practitioners for a while until they really fully understand what you're asking them to do. But the, you know, that's a, a long journey from awareness to adoption. But in my experience, and I'm sure there'll be many people who will share this experience, that isn't sufficient because there are many, many examples of ideas that have been adopted by a particular group of people. But when that group of people disbands for whatever reason, perhaps as simply as simple as somebody going on leave, you know, for a, for a, 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 a space of time, or, or the leader of the team um, moving on to something else, that idea falls into disrepair and eventually disuse, disappears. So if we're serious about knowledge translation, we've got to go even one step further. And Pathman calls this adherence. It means taking an idea through the stages of agreement and adoption into the policies and the structures of the organization that is using that idea, perhaps even as far as into the policies of, of a country and the standards of a country. And in Pattern, from Pattern's point of view, knowledge translation isn't finished until we've gone through all of those four stages. So when we developed the strategy for Dementia Training Australia, we tried to make sure that all of our activities fitted into this, this schema so that we could understand our business and know precisely what we were trying to get out of each of our activities. So what I'd like to do over the next uh, two or three minutes is just illustrate to you some of the activities of, of Dementia Training Australia and map them against that uh, knowledge translation schema. Well, one of the things that we did, in fact, we did a great many of these, was, was guest lectures. Really something similar to what we're doing at this, at this moment. You know, we got together experts in the field and uh, we put them in front of an audience, uh, often um, you know, using similar technology to, to, to the technology we're using at the moment. And they would talk in the way I'm talking for about half an hour about their speciality. Now, in the olden days, that might have been thought to have been a, you know, as, as a significant contribution. In our way of seeing things, it really is almost the least you can do. Because actually in a 30 minute or an hour long presentation, all you can really do is raise people's awareness of an idea. You know, a guest lecture isn't a place where you can actually help them understand how to do things. Nor is it a place where you can gauge whether or not it's relevant to their context, to their situation, and whether or not they agree with it sufficiently to be ready to go on to adoption. So it's worthwhile doing, but you have to have um, a sensible understanding of what you're going to get out of that activity. Another thing that we did that we hoped would take us a little bit more towards agreement was we launched a journal, but not an, academic, not an academic journal, a popular journal, the Australian Journal of Dementia Care. I hoped that this journal would become the sort of popular mechanics of dementia, you know, a place where people would go, not just for new ideas, but for pretty detailed information on how to do things. And I think to some extent that, that, that was successful. It certainly it was certainly successful in raising awareness of new ideas. Um, and I think it helped it was, it has helped to establish a culture of change in Australia. You know, a, a culture where people are ready to look for and to take up new ideas. And that, that journal is still going now. 
In fact, uh, I started before uh, Dementia Training Australia started. I started in the, in the organization that preceded DTA. And it has now been going for about eight years. And it's a very successful journal. Our next stage was to develop the online resources required by, by, the, by the government. And these we have always tried to create with a view to putting into the hands of their users things that people can actually use to make a difference. So many of the online resources uh, are you know, in the form of downloadable um, you know, uh, prompts, you know, cards that help people remember what to do in certain circumstances. Um, resources that guide them through, uh, for example, um, deep prescribing. You know, in, in Australia, there's major overuse of psychotropic medication. You know, we have online resources to help people understand their situation and, and go through a deep, prescri deep prescribing uh, process. We also similarly provide a lot of online courses. <coughs> These courses vary from uh, fairly short courses with fairly limited aims to extensive courses that include feedback on, 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 on the student's performance and even sort of personalized, individualized tuition and coaching. And in those circumstances, we can really get you know, very good levels of adoption. You see that as I go through this uh, presentation, I'm trying to unpack our activities in terms of these stages of knowledge translation. One of the most powerful <coughs> mechanisms for bringing about change we found over several years has been providing workshops, genuine workshops that might go for a couple of days where the audience is really quite small, it might only be 12 or 15 people, and they spend those two days with two, three, or even four experts in a particular field, for example, deep prescribed, or in my case, environmental design, and go in great detail into a topic of relevance to them. You know, this is, the, the, the workshops are at their best when the people who attend have already gone through the stages of awareness and agreement and are ready to come to a workshop to learn how to do things. That's certainly what we expected of our workshops in Dementia Training Australia. We had a similar approach to vocational training. Uh, we call this Dementia Essentials and this was in fact a three-day face-to-face course for direct care staff. A very, very powerful intervention because we've learned, and this is so bringing a bit you know, you know, um, humbling, that it is possible, in fact, to get across the essentials of dementia care in as little as three days. You know, the, the, the direct care staff don't need a, a great deal of um, knowledge in neuroanatomy or you know, the effects of medication on people with dementia or anything like that. There's a, there's a quite a finite set of skills and attitudes that they need to be alerted to and brought into contact with. And we found that we can do that in three days really very effectively and demonstrate significant changes in practice as, re as a result of that three days of interaction. <coughs> One of the most useful things that we discovered was the power of smartphone apps. We developed um, two or three, I, I think after I left it, another one came online. Uh, there was one to help in deep prescribing. The one I'm most familiar with and the one I developed was what we call the BT, the Built Environment Assessment Tool Dementia. And this is a, a smartphone app that enables people to, to evaluate their own residential care setting or hospital setting using a well-validated assessment tool. And by completing that tool using the, the app, they received uh, from Dementia Training Australia a very detailed report highlighting the strengths and weaknesses 
of their, um, their facility and laid out in such a way that it encouraged them to go ahead and discuss amongst themselves how to improve their situation. And if that wasn't sufficient for them, we provided a consultancy service that in, in, included DTA staff going on site to help them put into practice what they discovered you know, through the smartphone app or through the, the online courses or the, uh, the workshops or anything else that they had, that they'd, uh, that they had used. And those consultancy services were a very powerful way of bringing about change in change-ready organizations. I have to say that they are a very expensive way of providing education and training and support, and they have to be used very sparingly and very wisely. And by that, I mean, it's sensible to spend some time at the beginning of this process to assess whether or not the organization is change-ready. I mean, sometimes organizations have got a sort of passing fancy that they want to make change, or they have a particular, a particularly um, alert member of staff who wants to make change. But that's not sufficient. You, know, you can pour a lot of resources uh, into trying to change an organization that simply hasn't got the, the readiness or the resources to make a change. So before we put in any consultancy services, we made a very hard-headed assessment of the readiness for change of those organizations and shared the findings with them uh, before going ahead. And I, I think that was a very, very sensible thing to do. Now you'll see that we're getting closer to adherence. Now adherence takes a long time. You, it, to take a, an idea from its first stages of awareness right through to embedding it in quality assurance processes and standards can take many, many years. I'm very happy to say that we were able to, to complete that process in DTA, certainly in the area of environmental design, where the principles of design that we used in all of our environmental design training became adopted uh, by the authors of the Australasian Health Facility Guidelines. And these are guidelines that uh, guide the design of hospitals, not only in Australia, but in, in, in the Australasian area. And within those guidelines, there's a very clear description and you know, instruction that the principles of design that we used in DTA that have got a history that goes back to 1986 and 87, and that I will explain in a tiny, tiny amount of detail in a minute or two's time. Um, you know, they, the Australasian Health Facility Guidelines said these are the things that should be used when you're designing hospital facilities for people with dementia or other cognitive impairments. And as well as that, I'm pleased to say that the principles that we used in Dementia Training Australia uh, became to be adopted by the Quality Standards uh, Organization in, in Australia. This is the organization that visits aged care facilities in Australia on, on a regular basis and puts them through a rigorous assessment of their uh, policies and procedures and their operations. And they uh, use the principles of design as a guide to the comments and advice they give in relation to the, to the built environment. So what I hope I've demonstrated in this brief overview of DTA is the range of activities that it is possible to put within the sort of framework of dementia training. But I think perhaps even more importantly, the usefulness of having a knowledge translation framework that allows you to understand what and why you are doing. In other words, it helps you to understand the nature of your business and to set realistic goals for each of the activities that you undertake. Now, I'd like to go on and because my brief was to talk about our dementia training 
and to talk about environmental design, I'd like to go on in just in the briefest time possible and really in the most superficial way, introduce you to 10 basic design principles. Um, I'd be very pleased if at the end of this presentation, you know, in half an hour's time, you could remember three or four of them. I think that would be a wonderful thing. I'd be disappointed if you don't remember that there are some design principles available, which have been shown over the course of 30 years uh, to be useful in helping people understand how to design well for people with dementia. And the first of them is really quite commonplace, and that is that we must provide a safe environment. And, you know, safety is easily understood. You know, it's the avoidance of trip hazards and things like that. But in the context of dementia, there's a special consideration that has to be taken into account. And that's a consideration that is clear when anybody walks into a large number of Australian dementia facilities. And that is that they are not just obviously safe, they are obviously secure. They're secure in the sense that the people are locked in these places. They are prevented from moving around, around the building freely because there's an enormous fear that they might get into difficulties. And the way in which the, the, this security or this safety is, is presented is very obvious. You know, they are locked doors. There are fences that are very, very obvious. Now, the net result of that sort of approach to safety is to make the person with dementia feel trapped, to make them feel frustrated. And this leads to a buildup of frustration, agitation, and sometimes aggression. When we approach design in a different way, which involves unobtrusively providing a safe environment, the situation changes dramatically and the, those levels of frustration, agitation and aggression drop significantly. <coughs> Principle number two is about the size of places. There's no doubt that a large place intimidates people with dementia. You know, they feel as if they're rattling around like peas in a pod and they feel uncomfortable and disoriented. So we need to give people with dementia places that are of a human scale. That's not hard to understand. And if we add to that what I call good visual access, then we begin to have something which is well worth having. I try to explain good visual access by asking a question. The question is, have you ever been lost on a tennis court? I, I, you know, I, I know a lot of people who've lost on tennis courts, I've lost on tennis courts, but I've never been lost on a tennis court because I can see everything I need to see. But if you can see everything you need to see, you don't get lost. So the question is, why don't designers, when they're de designing for people with dementia, design places where the confused person can always see what they need to find? You know, if you can see your bedroom door, if you can see the kitchen, if you can see the sitting room, if you can see an exit to the garden, you can't get lost. Now that's a simple principle, but one which is not always present, even in modern day design, but it, it revolutionizes the quality of life uh, experienced by people with dementia. The fourth principle I'm sure you'll agree with, because you will know that people with dementia respond very badly to overstimulation. They have great difficulty in filtering out uh, stimuli. And if they are overstimulated, again, we get agitation and sometimes aggression. So we must have environments where all unhealthy stimulation is taken away. But of course, we don't want sterile environments. So we take the opportunity to make sure that helpful stimulation, pleasant stimulation, aesthetic stimulation is provided by reducing all of the unnecessary stuff in all of the notice boards, fire extinguishers, signs and you know for the staff that you know are simply clutter for the person with dementia. We create space for things which are more helpful. The sixth thing that we must do is we must support movement and engagement. We must you know try to avoid that 
confused wandering, which is so common in many places where people with dementia live, which is produced by the poor design of the place, I replace that with pleasant strolling, where people walk from one place to another, engaging with activities as they move around. Preferably moving from the inside to the outside to get a breath of fresh air, you know, when it's appropriate, uh, and then back to the inside again. And we do this by the careful design of what you might call strolling paths or wandering paths. The seventh thing that we want to do is to capitalize on the remaining abilities of people with dementia. And one of their remaining abilities is their memory of things in their distant past. We know they can't remember things uh, in, the, uh, in the near past, and they have great difficulty in learning new things, but they can remember things from the distant past. Now that means that when we design for people with dementia, we need to make sure the designs echo their past experience, not challenge them by presenting them with things that they can't understand and can't learn to use, but reflect the experiences in their early lives. This doesn't mean that we've got to uh, produce museums. Uh, you know, we can be clever about things. I mean, you know, some, some chairs and tables and such like have been chairs and tables for, you know, they are, they are iconic, you know, things like that. Um, so we can, we can be sensible about providing familiar spaces. The eighth thing that we found, and researchers support, supported this in recent years, that people with dementia require a variety of spaces. The old idea of you know, a single day space, uh, you know, a, a utility room that does everything, does not provide them with the variety that they require. They need to have spaces which remind them of what to do. You know, if, you are, you know, if, if a person walks into a, a place which is clearly a pleasant dining room, they are cued to have something to eat. If they are obliged to walk into a room which is now a, a dining room because the, ch the tables are set up, but 10 minutes ago it was a ping pong room, and you know, you know, three hours before that it was a lecture room, then they are going to be confused. You know, people with dementia will be confused. So we need a variety of spaces which clearly give them a message as to what is required and provide them with opportunities to engage with a variety of activities. The ninth and the second from last principle <coughs> is that we must not repeat what we've done in England, in, Aust in Australia, in the States, in a great many places of creating ghettos for people with dementia, where they are placed and forgotten about. If we do that, we deny them their identity, because as the, as the, the dementia progresses, their ability to remember who they are diminishes, and they need support to remember who they are. And who better to support them than the members of their own community, their families, their friends, you know, their, their ex-neighbours. If we take them from that community and place them in a place that is distant from that community, and even worse, in a place which is locked and it's difficult to get into, you know, where there where they are limited visiting hours and such like, we deny them the opportunity of interacting with the people who can maintain their identity. It's not just, a, 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 it's not just a, an unpleasant thing to do, it is a devastating thing to do. So we must design and provide places that have strong links with local communities. And that brings me to the final principle, which is that all design for people living with dementia must begin with a vision for the way of life of those people. In other words, before I sit down with architects or designers and put pen, you know, pencil to paper to devise a plan on what the facility is going to look like, I engage with them to get them to describe 
in as much detail as they possibly can, how they want the people with dementia to live in that facility, not to be treated in that facility or to survive in that facility, but how they want them to live full lives in that facility. And there's a variety of answers though. There's no one answer. I mean, some organizations will accentuate the spiritual aspect of life as being an essential component of a full life. Others will accentuate engagement with ordinary activities of daily living. Some will emphasize recreational activities. Now, I, I really don't mind what the vision for the way of life is, provided there's a well-articulated vision, because when we've got that, we can start designing a place using the previous nine principles as guidelines, but we can start designing a place that will result in people living with dementia having a full and satisfying life. So thank you very much for that. Um, that's the end of my presentation. I will stop sharing my screen and return to the chairperson. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure all of you would agree with me. That was an excellent talk. And uh, how effortlessly Professor Fleming packed such a lot of information into a 30 minute talk and present in a very lucid and very simple way. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Fleming. Uh, I must say that the geriatric unit or the Department of Psychiatry here at the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences has indeed immensely benefited from your talk. And uh, I understand from Dr. Shio Kumar and others that they have a fairly easy access to you and you have been very uh, lavish with your time in uh, being able to uh, interact with them and you have kindly agreed to do that so even in future as they are beginning this big task for the country in India. I must say that uh, you have very clearly talked to us about the various types and formats of training that the Dementia Training Australia had undertaken over the years. Then you told us the importance of closing the knowledge do gap. You explained to us the four stage closing the gap program and the various activities undertaken, including the starting of the popular journal. Now in India, when we think of this, we have to think of at least 15 different languages. I mean, you have again and again highlighted the importance of contextualizing your presentation and making necessary adaptations. I'm sure the people have taken that point. And also you have in a very lucid way uh, described to us the 10 principles of design. Uh, the network was very kind to us. The whole presentation went off very well. Your slides were very clear. We could see you also, your, you know, your face, et cetera, very well. And Dr. Shiva Kumar tells me that although the 30 minutes time allotted to this is already, uh, we are past that, there could be little time for a couple of questions if anybody in the actual real life physical audience here may want to raise. He has kindly agreed because it's not always that we get good network and an excellent internationally recognized, uh, you know, expert like you to answer questions. So are there any questions which anybody wants to ask? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether uh, Professor Fleming has heard this. The question is, how do you handle aggressive behavior in uh, aged care settings? Or? In Australia. In Australia. Oh, this is a larger question. How do you handle aggressive behavior in the elderly in Australia? Professor Fleming? In dementia care settings. In dementia care settings and facilities. Dr. Uh, Fleming? As you said, that's a, that, that is really a very, very large uh, question. And in fact, it's, it's one that Dementia Training Australia and some other government funded services in Australia 
um, spent a lot of time on because it's a, it's a major issue uh, in many, many places in Australia. The basic answer is we try to avoid reaching, uh, uh, we try to avoid the situation in which the person with dementia responds with aggression. Our basic point of view is that aggression is responsive behavior. You know, this is a, this is a phrase that we use time and time again. You know, people with dementia respond aggressively to certain stimuli. And our first task is to try to work out what it is that is causing them to respond aggressively. And that we, we put a lot of effort into doing that. And sometimes it's the built environment. You know, sometimes it's so frustrating that they can't find a way around. Sometimes it's so noisy. Sometimes it lacks you know, basic amenities like you know, the opportunity to, to go outside and experience some fresh air. You know, when we put those environmental issues right, then the level of aggression reduces. Sometimes it's interpersonal difficulties between, um, between the residents themselves or between the residents and particular members of staff. Um, and well, we've got to investigate those. Sometimes it's responses to the, um, the, the operations, you know, the, the, the structure, the timetabling. I mean, the classic example is being woken up very early in the morning and told that you have to have a shower. Now, you know, you know I, 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 I have to confess, I'm English. And there's an old joke about English people. You know, the, old, the old joke was that, you know, uh, you know if, if you ever want to hide your money in England, you put it under the soap. I mean, this is an old joke. I mean, it's, it's an Australian joke as well, told against the English. I mean, the notion being that English people didn't wash enough. In Australia, it seems you know, it's part of the culture that everybody has to have a shower every morning. Well, if you try telling that to, a, to an 80 year old person with dementia who thinks he's still in England, you're gonna get an aggressive response. So this regime of showering every morning just by itself causes a great deal of aggression. So we investigate you know, the, 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 the policies and procedures that result in that sort of operation. So there's a, there's a whole host of things that have to go in, has to go in to understanding why the person with dementia is responding aggressively. And as a last resort, we will come to the conclusion that the cause of the aggression is the dementia itself. You know, the, the, the brain damage which is occurring, uh, particularly in the frontal lobes, is precipitating this aggression. And in those circumstances, we may be driven to the use of, of medications. But I have to say that we're getting better and better at avoiding the medications in, in responding to, to, to aggression. I hope that's gone at least somewhere to answer your question. Thank you. Uh, there is one more question. Uh, you know, probably that in India, we have to depend immensely on the family members. The questionnaire, the question is from Dr. C. H. Chandrasekhar. He asks, how do you motivate family members of the elderly uh, dementia sufferers, especially those who are burned out. Yeah. My heart goes out to the people who are burned out and I, you know, the, it's, it's such a, such a challenging job caring for a person with dementia. Um, even in the, in some ways, ideal circumstances of their own home, you know, where their surroundings are familiar and they are, you know, they, we, we, we can expect them to, in good circumstances, to feel comfortable. But it does take an enormous effort. In, in Australia, the effort often falls on, on the female side of the family and eventually they, they do burn out. What we try to do, and I don't, you know, is, is to offer respite of, vari of, of various sorts. It's not always successful. And sometimes, more often than I would like to uh, see, you know, the, 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 the bridge or the link between the family members and the person with dementia does disappear. And they do become essentially the, you know, in the care of, of, of the residential facility or, or the hospital. And this seems that there's very little that we can do to re-engage with the family. 
I think all we can do in those circumstances is to, main, is, is to maintain contact with them, you know, con maintain their awareness of the um, of their of the of their loved one with dementia. Hopefully, give them good news about their their activities, about their engagement with things, and constantly offer invitations for them to uh, come and visit. But of course, again, speaking as somebody who's passionate about environmental design, we have to make sure that the environment that they come to is welcoming. You know, that there is a place where they can spend time in comfort with their loved one, that there is a place where they perhaps can take them to be away from the other people with dementia that are milling around and, and, and spend some private time and perhaps even some, you know, some pleasant time over a cup of tea or something like that. You know, we can, we can do a lot in terms of, of environmental design to make it attractive uh, to people to visit. Now, one of the things that I've learned over the last few years is the best way to do this is to make it attractive to children. Because one of the difficulties that the carer of the person with dementia often has is the difficulty of caring for their family and the person with dementia. And if that family consists of young children, you know, the conflict of taking a young person, a young child to a very unattractive and frightening dementia unit almost guarantees that they will not go. So we have to make our places where people with dementia live friendly for children as well. And that of course is extremely good for the people with dementia because they get, they like nothing better than to see children milling around enjoying themselves. I hope that didn't take up too much of the available time. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fleming. Now we have to conclude this session. Thank you.